All right, guys. Uh, it was a little difficult getting episodes and everything together. We had some ammo research and other issues coming together at once. So I have asked Jeff from Tal Flater Mouse. Hi, Jeff. Hello. And I've asked Bloke from the Bloke on the Range. Hi. You guys are really bringing the energy tonight, let me tell you. <laughs> and uh, we... I, I... I think we expended all our energy just trying to get this to all sync up. <laughs> yeah. So figure this out. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, uh, Tal lives in California and Bullock lives in Switzerland. Mm hmm. Yeah. So the time zone issue was a big one. So what time is it there for you, Bullock? It is 7 40 a.m. Nice. What do you got over there, Jeff? 11 40 p.m. And I am at like. 2.40 a.m. in the morning, which is my lunchtime, so okay. <laughs> but uh, we spent the last 40 minutes trying to figure out well, how the heck to share video and still have audio, so bear with us because we're not the smartest bunch. But uh, today, uh, I dug out some archival footage of some... Uh, I don't want to give too much away, but it's from some manufacturing in the World War One period, and none of us are particularly versed in this sort of thing. So I thought it'd be fun for us to make fools of ourselves guessing what's going on on the screen. Uh, you guys down? Oh yeah, yeah. I did. I I wasn't sure what exactly we were gonna comment about, but that sounds like a good idea because um, I have no idea what this this guy is doing with this. I think he's making a loaf of bread. That's my yeah. That's my early guess too. All right, let me uh, let me get this going though. Right, you guys see the video? I think this guy's forging receiver blanks. I think he's blow, blowing out his eardrums. That's got to be extremely loud. Oh, God, yeah. He doesn't have any hearing protection, does he? He doesn't have any protection. Oh, he's got gloves. Okay. he's well, his... Okay, that'll keep him from going deaf. Okay, what... His best is shirt. That looks like what? wire straightening, steel straightening. Uh, or uh, or possibly uh, making it all of a, an even uh, even diameter. Oh, no, yeah, it's gauging. That's right. Look at how it reduces oh, roll, in diameter. rolling. Yeah, it's yeah. rolling. Because they're not, they're not very straight. No, well, these guys are getting them a little straighter. So that's Wait. basically pre-drilled barrel banks, barrel, pre-drilled barrel blanks being straightened. Do you think they're pre-drilled? Uh, and then this is, this is deep drilling. Yes. Look at it. So maybe oh, this yeah. is the raw drilling, because there's no way this is, because you can see it there. It's not straight. I'm mm -hmm. kind of surprised he had a turret there, you know. It yeah, you, done. Know, you want to go back? it off to the next guy on the on the left. Yeah, the way it indexes. Yeah, yeah. Is so wait, let's... Out of order. Is, that, is that final chambering, perhaps? Hold on, I'm going to go... Let me... Okay, so we got the guys that are... We've agreed on this one that we're, we're sort of gauging it to the correct diameter. Yeah, that's, that's basic straightening, but they're clearly not drilled. You can see there's no hole. Wait, let me get one thing straight. The... This section here, these guys have not perfectly even cylindrical objects. So how did the roller spit out I something mean, with a chamber? I think they're out of order because the next thing with the turret, um, once you paused it, I could see they're chamber reamers. Oh, no, wait, that is... Hold on, if you look carefully at the bottom of the screen there... Let me see if I can pause it. That thing is not evenly diametered. It might be in order. It's got a swell at the end. Is it just the shadow? No, it's got to be a swell. Oh, well, anyway, okay, so we get to the turret. So what were you guys telling me about the turret? So the the, the turret, I think that's out of, out of order. That's, that's no, sorry, we're still, yeah, we're still straightening. Because they're, we're straightening things which haven't got holes down them. Right. But then if they don't have holes down them, then that would be... Yeah, because this could be an initial drill. I think he's, it's not he's, a, you see, he's pause drilling it. for a chamber. Pause it. It, does look, uh, it does look like a chamber reamer, doesn't it? Yeah, so yeah. Facing the camera slightly to the left is a, is a basic drill, and then there's a series of, uh, of roughing and finishing reamers going on there. So I think that's way out of order. I think that's at the end of the barrel-making process. Hold on. Watch the, watch the chuck, as it were. Like, is that thing rolling straight? Oh, it does look pretty straight, doesn't it? Yeah, it's pretty straight. Yeah, that might be out of order. No! Well... I don't know, when he set it down in there, it looked like it wobbled a bit. Look at that. Or that's just him letting his hand well, off. It's, it's going to wobble. He, he just I, has like a steady, a, half of a steady rest. It looks like the barrel's threaded already at that point. 
see well you, you got about two you got about two frames and you can see that it's already uh, pre pre drilled okay so what are we doing uh, now mm. like some sort of grinding profiling going on is yeah, it yeah uh, surface grinding it grinding the outer contour possibly the, maybe it's a very complicated looking rig for just that Oh, it's back that's out that's how they did it back in the day, though. They, uh, they had super complicated machines that did relatively simple things. I mean, these days we're used to just CNCing the crap out of everything. You know, yes and no, though, because you talk to guys that are in CNC and they're just like, oh, this is a pain. It's almost easier to chalk it up in the lathe. Mm. Now, this is interesting. I can't really see exactly what's going on here. But I do like seeing the, the belts because there would be like one... <laughs> There'd be if people take this for granted, but there'd be one motor running everything in the factory, and then it would just be belt-driven machines that you just sort of like they had their own little transmissions and kick-out gears or whatever. Like it'd be like the power takeoff on a jeep or something, you know. So it is, I, I and you can see if... there's multiple speeds. They could you know change the speeds with those uh, very variable pulleys up. Well, we're still in barrel uh, manufacture. I can't figure out what the heck they're doing here, though. Uh, oh, they're definitely blanks. They're not threaded. Uh, it's the muzzle end. My initial thought was that maybe they were uh, cutting the keyway for a line in the sights, but they're not threaded yet, so the threads can't be timed. So well, why are they yeah. going back and forth like that, too, though? Like, what it's, a it... shaper. A sh it's a shaper. It's a single point, single point cutter. I think whatever the action is, we can't see it. It's behind those flywheels or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Something's going on in the front of it. I, I love this part. Oh, can you yeah. imagine yep. doing that for eight, ten hours a day? Let me let me pause this for a second because a lot of people don't realize this. This is these guys. Um, whenever I go through ordnance files and stuff, these guys are always the ones that they complain about not having enough of. Like they're always looking for professional barrel straighteners because what they're doing is uh they have the barrels let me rewind this and just let it play again that they're putting the barrels up looking through them and then gauging where they're crooked and then quickly i mean very quickly they're able to sort of put those vices down on them and actually kink the barrels back into sh shape using that sort of big ship's wheel thing i can't imagine how much torque is on that thing too Oh yeah, and the uh, the number of barrel straightening operations was huge. Um, I think for Car ninety eight K production, it was something like six or eight. Uh, it's in the collector grade book, um, and it was a big deal. Um, something that, that, that the Brits worked out during World War Two was actually only the last six inches need to be straight, so they could do it with a plug gauge, and any, and anyone could uh, could do it. But until then, people did this, and they were highly skilled, they were highly paid, but they were working all day. Long oh, could, could you imagine just going in here and telling them, hey, it's you only have to do the last six inches, watch. Like, do you know how much time <laughs> that probably... Like, just the things you don't know that you just keep doing. Yeah, just imagine giving a guy who's, who's done an apprenticeship and uh, has spent years and years and years training to do this, and he can do it like this at this speed, and you give him a plug gauge. Oh. <laughs> All right, what have we got going? Oh, these are duplicators. I can tell stock duplicators. Um, Springfield National Historic Site still has one on display. That's a beautiful thing to see. Oh, it's too bad they're just sort of hidden. Um, so you have. Let me slow down for a second. You, you have the rifle stock blank right there, and I can start. I guys, any guess on which rifle this is? Just off that stock blank. Um, but, between the recent twenty-two. The receiver forging and that stock blank, I think I can guess pretty pretty well, but I also know this is US footage, so Springfield. Yeah, those are those are gonna be uh, M17s. Yeah, 1917, I'm getting I'm betting. Um but where am I at? Uh yeah, so okay, so those wood blanks go up on the roller and then there's a there's an already formed metal version of the stock, usually smaller. And then the stock duplicator is just kind of like a 3D plotter. Like, it just sits there. and Like a, pa like a pantograph, right? Yeah, actually, pantograph's a good one. Um, you should honestly Google that, because there's... Uh, what's the name of the guy that made one recently? Or more recently, that's everybody's using their whole routers to do now. But, um, yeah, they're super cool devices. I wish there was a better shot of it here. I, I assume the camera guy was too afraid to bring the camera down in with all those belts. <laughs> I mean, could you imagine, by the way, getting your hand caught in one of those belts? Look at the things. 
Yeah, th- they talk about factory accents back then. Well, now you know why it was so common. Like, just walk past one of those suckers. Oh, no guards on the machines, no eye protection, no hearing protection. It's uh, pre-health and safety. <laughs> Definitely. Hey, they got that light bulb hanging down there on the left. You see it in the background. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they can see what you're doing. <laughs> Just by the way, that's the electric wire. It's probably hey, practically exposed. Can I borrow that light bulb? Oh. Right, I saw two loop. light bulbs. Just, I wonder if we're a loop tied in the cord. Just to no, make. we're definitely out of order. Look at this. So this is yeah. These are pre-duplicated stocks. Yeah. So it's cutting that semi-pistol grip right there too. Look at it, cut it out. I'm gonna go back and see that again. How does that do that? Hey, at least that thing's sucking up the wood chips. <laughs> yeah. Look at I, bet, I, I bet even despite that, I bet he, every night that guy goes home, he blows out just sawdust out of his nose. How does it do that? Look at that. There must be some guide that we're not seeing down on the bottom, because look at the... I th- uh, yeah, I think there's a... I think there's yeah, there's, a, there's cam a, there's followers. Cam, and stuff. cam guide at the bottom. Watch, watch. Ooh, semi-pistol grip. <laughs> just, just doing that all day. Again, you know, can, you, can you imagine? And that fun- thing is... Tremendously loud. You ever, you know, like a oh, router God. with no hearing protection? Those things are so loud. That oh, wait. There's our, there's our duplicator. It's back in order now. Okay. But it's it's only one quick shot of it. Let me replay it here. Watch. And it's gone. <laughs> but we're sanding oh, now, God. so that's good. Yeah, I wonder how loud it really is. I mean, the wood cutting and stuff would be loud, but you'd be running on a belt, so you wouldn't have the motor right there with you. Well, the motor's not very yeah, loud. It's a... Uh, yeah, yeah. What the is bearings this? and everything. Okay, wait, what is this guy doing? Because he's doing it so quickly. Oh, we're back to... I like his hat. Yeah. Boy, he's <laughs> sitting there... Very out of order. By the way, no face masks. You know how many lung diseases these guys probably got from all that... Like, just stuff in the air? Oh. But... All right, let's see. Get past the sanding. And then... It's pretty impressive just hand sanding it like that. Oh, yeah. All right, what is this guy? I feel like we're out of order again, though. This guy's cutting. It's just taking one specific cut, but where? No idea. Might be that bolt handle route. Mm. Now we're back in order again because it's already gone through the gross sanding. What is guy. on that guy's head, though? Huh? Yeah, like, he had some weird strap on his head. What is that? I don't know. He couldn't afford the cool hat, I guess. That's got it. It's just, I mean, maybe it's like an early sweatband. I don't know. That guy's got a kepi. Where did he get that? He joined the French Foreign Legion and got it. All right. I like this. This is my favorite. Because I've seen this done with many military stocks. Because everyone yeah. talks about, like, yeah, the for the boiled linseed oil or whatever that is in there, just heat up the oil and dunk them in. They do have a, safe, a safety chain to keep people from falling into that <laughs> boiling oil. Yeah, that's good. I wonder how hot it is, because they touch it right away. They've probably got hands of leather, though, doing this all day, every day. Yeah, but I'm not seeing a lot of, like... You'd think there'd be, like, steam or something from that wood hitting there, but... Oh, wait, what are we doing now? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we are drilling a block of metal. Oh, you know what? This is the polymer 80 right here. <laughs> this, this Seriously, this is this is polymer 80 territory. Look at this. So this were those forgings we saw earlier. See them over here? The finished product? And then... In a jig? One yeah. hole, two holes... I mean, this is holes and so on. This is dead on what you do with the polymer eighty. I don't understand. All the drills look the same size. They're probably there four. It's probably just slightly different drill drill sizes. Ooh. Or drill depths. Is that a uh, nibbler? Yes. Look at that. It's a oh god, what's it called? Brocher. Oh, cool. Thank you, brocher. That's it. That is some dirty ass work. Well, look at the, the, look at the, the wait, curl, what? curls coming out. You know, it's it's broaching it, broaching something. The receiver or something. Yeah, they're cutting a a long shape. That's how you make square holes with a brooch. Probably the magwell. Yeah, I mean that could be. Does that guy have all his fingers on him? Huh? Was that? Did that guy have all ten fingers? I think maybe. Wait, hold on. 
<laughs> yeah, he looks like he's got it. Sorry, what was Bloke saying? I didn't hear him. Um, we're saying that it's difficult to see which way round it's gone in because that's not a very long cut. So it... no, that okay. So that's uh, this is the muzzle side, or not muzzle, but it'd be the chamber side. Uh, let me see if I can slow it down here. The kid looks like he's like 15 years old. Oh uh, yeah, right. We see it him be cut. flip one I in. Bet it, I bet it's cutting the slot for the uh, um, for the sear to go through. Because it's not a very long cut. The sights are high, so it's the sights it, are high. That looks like ejection uh, port. The um, the notch for the for the stripper clip guide or something. Oh yeah, that'd be a good one. Or something in the area of the sights. Or maybe it is doing the rear sight. And we're just not seeing it. All right, we're such into grinding. Short, such a short cut, though. Yeah. What are we grinding? Oh, bolts. I see bolt handles. I feel like we missed a lot of steps on the bolt. <laughs> oh, yeah. Look like at that little uh, check block thing to check if it's the right diameter. Oh, yeah, that's actually interesting. Just a quick uh, gauge. Yeah, it's so funny, but in the show... Oh, look at that. I want to watch him do that again. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me go back and pause for a second. Uh, yeah, so we talk about it in the show all the time. We're like, yeah, it took a while to get the the tooling up, and you gotta you gotta. It's not just designing the gun; it's designing the process for manufacturing the gun. I think people are starting to like maybe watching something like this. You might realize the gun itself is a object worthy of you know praise or criticism or whatever. But the process to get to that gun, and you see this, and you start to think about like the features the Germans kept all the way through the war, and you realize like, holy crap! They like how much extra time went into doing one little thing. With, so with the Germans, many. When you, when you when you read the um the description of the the manufacturing process, all they ever did really was leave out some of the more expensive steps. They never sort of fully uh, rationalized it. Um, using things like timed threads or anything like that. And, and one of the reasons why a lot of the Mausers have every part stamped is that they, uh, they assembled the rifle in the white, disassembled it, and then blued it all, and then screwed it all back together. Oh, good lord. That's were, were like that, whereas um, um, well, the Americans were the, just sort of from the First World War onwards. I mean, this is, this is the height of um, production engineering for rifles at the time. I mean, this is going to be um, either Winchester or one of the Remington. Oh, yeah. This, well, was as, this was as good as it got at the time. In terms of speed, yeah. I mean, they dumped these things out faster yeah. than anything else. And in terms of the technology they're using, I mean, it's, it's still First World War era tech, but this is absolute state of the art. But just look at the number of people, the number of machines compared to how it's done, uh, how it's done these days. That's crazy. What were you about to say, Tal? I forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> it wasn't important. That's fair. I feel that way a lot. So it looks like they're attaching the magazine base already? No, what is going on here? Oh, no, they are assembling. Okay, so it's assembly now. God, look how fast he does that. I think recently there are some videos of, like, Russian kids taking down and, and re reassembling uh, AKs. Let's let's look at this guy just like assemble a nineteen seventeen real quick. This is fun. I mean, I know the footage is a little fast, but look at him go. Yeah, he's using that. You know, no power tools back then, but that little that brace and bit rig on his hip there it sure worked. Out. And look, so look at he, he, from I was just gonna say oh, on, on their on their tummies there, they got some like a leather like a leather thing to prop that thing against. Yeah. You know, but what you're not, what you're not seeing here is hand fitting. And that's where you guys were just way ahead of, of everyone else with um, such a high degree of interchangeability. The, all those bands and everything, they just go on. Yeah. They slap. Well, I mean, we are not, kind of seeing it because like he does just sort of, did he actually throw on the front band? Yeah. It's not on there. So, 
He just grabs a front band and just tosses it. Like, he's just tossing in the floor plate. He's tossing on the handguard. He's tossing on the front band. Like, like he just grabs a handguard, throws it on there, throws it on a lower band, taps right. it. Yeah. Taps the front one on. Screws. That's, yep, something. Can he screws the rear one? He's up and running. No, you're right. It's showing it. What's that guy in the background doing? He's just sort of working the bolt. He's flexing he's, he's on. I don't know. He's, uh... he's just looking busy. He's like, I want to be in the video. He kind of like keeps looking at the camera. <laughs> yeah. he's, just, he's that guy that's trying to look busy at work when the camera's on. Oh, okay, I guess this one's pretty good. <laughs> he's probably the guy that's paid the most. He's uh, he's in charge and he's checking the work of the others. So, There's uh, the yeah. bolt flexor. <laughs> What is going Okay, so something happened here, and I don't even know it. Okay, what are we looking at? There's some sort of bench rest, and... Looks like they're setting up... The yeah, rear sights. Oop, okay, we made it test firing. Are they, uh... Are they firing that on a rigid? What? Wait, they're, 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 oh no! Okay. Sight. Right. So um, this one's quite interesting. This is um, a kind of a British style um, um, factory testing rig, and uh, what he's got on there. Okay, this is super interesting. Right. This is really this is my this is my kettle of fish here. Um, These guys get earplugs. Did they have earplugs? Yeah. Look. Guys see guys that guy. Oh yeah, yeah. He's got some cotton or something in his ear. Yeah, but see, what he's got in his hands is a sighting telescope that rests on the sights. Go back a bit. That, that dude on the right there. Oh, yeah. So what they do is they, they, they place the telescope, he aims it, they take it off, fire. So is that, replace it. Is that like a periscope, though? Is it directing it like 90 degrees over to him? Because yeah. he's reading so, it at 90 degrees. Yep. The one is. Um, there's some footage of the uh, Long Branch factory testing number fours in a, in a very similar manner. And then this, then, so they use that for sighting. And a bit earlier, right. you saw him adjusting the sights with a, with a cramp. Oh, let me see if I can get it. There. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, you think about how long you can pay the gunsmith to zero your rifle or whatever. This guy could have done it in a heartbeat. I love that the rests are sort of spring-loaded. Look at them, and they slowly reset back... And the reason the the reason for that is they're trying to simulate as far as possible how it will be hold, held by a person, because it affects the point of impact with relate with relation to the sights. It's also I've noticed a lot of people like try to lock a gun up against a tree or something in order to test fire it, and then they end up blowing the stock out. <laughs> oh god! And the number of comments the number of comments I get saying that oh you shouldn't test a rifle like that you should always you should lock it down solid it was like well here's here's the guys doing it for real and they have mounts that are designed to move like a human shoulder yeah that's a lot because, of ex that's a lot of expense to do that that way too oh well because if you lock it down it'll be wrong <laughs> because it'll behave differently look at that They're hitting that paper take that norway <laughs> anyway, they're just mad at the, the Scandinavians. Apparently, it's black and white, so I can't tell which one. But you know, well, maybe it's Cornwall. Oh yeah, that's true. Okay, so then we get to uh, Rackham. Oh boy, that's that's the CMP dream right there. <laughs> the rack of nineteen seventeens. There's a lot of sweet hats in here. Yeah, what the hat variety in America was so... so many different styles of hats. Oh, here we go. Let's just splash it on. Okay. What what is that like? Cosmoline? It's maybe? probably mercury, you know. Oh, okay. That's probably <laughs> cosmoline or something. Well, it's probably their equivalent. Some oil. It looks too thin. Bacon, bacon fat. I mean, my nineteen seventeen was um, a factory refurb, a, a U.S. Arsenal refurb, and was covered in some. Not quite cosmoline. Stuff. Yeah, it's some sort of waxy grease for shipping. Yeah, the the one annoying thing is that that they parkerized the ever loving crap out of the bolt. Oh, look at that! No, it's up. it's definitely packed in something all over that dude's hands. The problem is people don't realize it's like it's got to go across the ocean and like you know not the best wooden crate, so you really got to keep that moisture off of there. Wait, did we, did we count how many guns were in each crate? No. Do we? Oh. It's a weird 
It looks like 3 2, maybe 3 2 again. That'd be 5 10. 10 a crate would be a nice even number. Uh, yeah, yeah. Or maybe 20. It's either somewhere. It's some denomination of 5. I want one of them delivered to my house. Not just one box, I mean that whole. The yeah, whole, whole card. Uh, imagine that. Oh, what are we at now? Uh, are we way out of order? What is going on? Oh, no, no, no. I see it. They're, they're long and flat. Do you see it in the foreground? Oh, they're making bayonets? Bayonets. Maybe? Yep. There they go. Uh. That good old P14 slash US1917. I actually have one that I love because it's got all the British marks uh, canceled out. And they canceled them out with this, like, uh, almost like the kind of stripes you see on, like, a work zone sign. And it's just like, why all that effort? Why not just put a big X on them? But it's actually like a ground-in pattern. Well, there's your proof they sharpened them. I get that well, a lot. Shop in the shop. Well, the people talk about how they don't sharpen them, but actually I've seen footage of them being sharpened at the front. Like, but you know, soldiers sharpened them, the armor sharpened them. Oh, now we're, now we're back at pre-drilled uh, rough barrel forgings. Yeah, what happened? Something got out of order. Yeah, this is crazy. Everything got out of order. And then, oh, here we go. Here's our missing barrel drilling, probably. <laughs> no? Profiling? Profiling, possibly. Okay, so that's, if that's profiling, what is going on here? Oh, whoa, oh. He just shoves that up in there. I'm going to assume that's more contouring of some sort. And then we're filling it with... That oh, he's lapping. Lead? Yeah, yeah, he's filling it with lead for lapping. Okay, wait, what's what's lead lapping? Right, lead lapping um, is a way of polishing the barrel. Um, oh, God, that guy died is... so soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, just dunk that lead in there. So what, so what that... So what he does is he puts a he puts a rod part way up, which will have a sort of stopper on the end and a jag to hold the lead. He pulls some lead down, um, and that that basically he makes a lead stopper that is intimately shaped to the inside contour of the barrel. You then put some um, um, some abrasive compound on it and push it back and forth a lot, and it uh, it polishes polishes the barrel. But it's interesting that they uh, they actually hand lap them or or machine lap them possibly. That's yeah, brilliant. I've got it. I've got an Ithaca thirty seven shotgun that just keeps sticking on extraction. So yeah, I know what I'm doing now. <laughs> <laughs> no pick. gloves. Molten lead. No gloves. Oh, you know he went. You know he went home. His wife was just like, mm, "Your hands taste so sweet." Like. <laughs> <laughs> Probably no ventilation, no extraction. Okay, wait, he's just put a key on there? What is going on? Why was that necessary? I gotta see that again. Okay, so I know we're on the underside of the barrel, I assume. Why did we need to put that... Or is this a different gun? This doesn't look like that. Look how short the barrel does is. Not look no, we are not nineteen seventeen territory anymore. Was that a gas key? Because if that's a gas key, I think I know what territory we're in. Oh, we're it's back. Like to... a Thompson or something? Oh, those are those are short. Now I'm gonna tell you that's that's gonna be the BAR. Ah, uh, okay. These guys have different barrel straighteners. Check them out. They put the ship's wheel lower. I'll, I'll be damned they let anyone sit down on the job though yeah what are the ladies like, everybody's standing up what are the what are the ladies doing here they got some sort of jig they set it up and then they they cut in threads it's too too it's not complicated enough to be a thread cut but it's doing something i can't see it all right well we got this guy now what in the world is going on here? Oh, stocks. Oh, yes, uh, it is. Oh. It's definitely the BAR because they're cutting it for the uh, for the. Um... Wait, did the early ones have a rear buffer? The early ones didn't have a rear buffer. That's just where the um, bolt extension goes, or whatever. Is there a bolt extension? I can't remember. No. 
But that's a VAR stock, just on the basis that it's that short, because we didn't have short magazine Lee Enfields or anything. Oh, there's a duplicator again. Yeah, there you go. That's a one-to-one -one duplicator. So that thing... Hold on, let me see what I should see. They're cutting out contours for that. So that's, the one in the background is metal, and the one in the foreground is wood. It's just duplicating it. Oh, wow. One at a checkering. time. Whoa, what did that guy just do? The, the checkering the foregrip? No, the checkering's already there. Or at least some the of it other is. direction. Oh, it is. You're right. It's out of order. This one, this this part came first. Look at that. Oh, uh, this would make Mark so unhappy because it's. <laughs> <laughs> so you would let's get that back in order. So you'd you put it in this doohickey. Oh, look at that. That's fantastic. I don't know why, but that's just so satisfying to me. Just cut that thing like bread, and then take it over and hand it to this guy. And he's just going to put it in the jig and roll it down. That's an interesting way to do, like, a router assembly, too, because it's got the guide on the, the block. Don't touch that thing by accident, though. Holy oh, crap, I know. Bro. Run your arm against that thing? Ooh. Yeah, look how easy that would be. You think you're working, like, six, seven days a week for, like, 12-hour shifts? Oh, here we go, receiver. Yeah, all, all you have to be is distracted for a millisecond. And, oh, oh. Ooh. Ooh, 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 look at that cut. Yeah, I mean, your, your mobile phone goes off and, oh, oh, oh. Bad joke. This re look at this receiver go. Did he just cut the whole rear, the, the whole trigger guard assembly or whatever? Like the path for the trigger, is that what that was? You guys even see it? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what he's doing. Watch it. I'm not sure which 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 way's even up. Okay, hold on. He grabs the receiver blank. Yeah, so he threw it in upside down. Yeah. M muzzle in forward. And then that looks like about where the tr trigger assembly would be in my mind. It looks like he's cutting the path for the trigger assembly to flow through. There's a guide. That'll, yeah, I noticed the guide, yeah. Yeah, the second it looks like two drill bits, but the one on the right's a guide, and it's sitting in a guide block. And the one on the left's the actual drill because yeah, it's got the water on it. Tracing it out, yeah, that's wild. So what's what's interesting from an engineering from a production engineering perspective here is that the the dude is literally just the muscle to move it. Yeah, it's actually um, kind of. Yeah. You're right. It's like he guides it into the jig, and aligns it, and then realistically. If you had enough sort of motor laying around, you wouldn't really need them to do anything other than that. No, because, I mean, these dudes were just operating the machines. They weren't setting the machines. There'd be a tool setter who would be paid more and would go around and set them up. And, uh, and, and once the stops would get out of line and what have you, um, once, once things started coming off, not passing the gauge, um, the tool setter would come along and, uh, and reset the machines. But basically, someone set the stops and all he has to do is do a specific series of movements up towards the stops, and that's all he does all day. And he gets very good and very fast at it. And this footage isn't even sped up by the look of it. It seems to be real tight. Yeah, this is a little bit slower than the other footage. Okay, what have we got going on here? Ooh. Is that a grinding wheel, or is that a boring? It looks like it's uh, smooth at the center, and it's grinding the face around the hole. Looks like it might be setting up the depth for where the receiver meets the barrel. And then we chuck... Wait, what are you just chucking there? The receiver? Apparently. I think that's, that's receivers in an earlier state. Now that's clocking. Dude, look at the wheel. So he's... He, now this is like what you were saying, where they're just the muscle. They're not even the muscle now. So whatever device this is, it's actually clocking... I, bet, I think... I think if I look, if I'm looking at it correctly, that's cutting the groove for the um, the operating handle. Okay, so it's a cam controlled machine. Yeah, look at it walk. So literally, all he's doing is, uh, yeah, all he's doing is uh, putting putting the workpiece in, tightening it down, and moving on. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to note now that we're this far in. A uh, complete lack of hats in this particular factory compared. Oh to the yeah, other. yeah. Because I don't think it's the same factory. 
And we're back to the Polymer 80 setup with the jig with the various drill bits. Now this is interesting too because it has fewer uh being an American designed firearm, perhaps they just went with uh fewer variances in the uh the drill hole size because there's only what like three drill bits on there? Versus yeah. we saw a whole line for the nineteen seventeen. So yeah. I, I assume three different size drill bits. I mean it, it... It's the sort of thing you guys were, were good at. Was saying, why do we need three different types of screw and three different sizes of hole? We can do them all the same. You just change the length of the pin or whatever so that you know which one goes where. Oh, I love this guy's finesse. I don't even know what we're doing right now, but I love this. Let him just like, hammer. It's like Teddy Roosevelt. Yeah, but watch him hammer him in. So, oh, yeah. Bam, 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 bam. So the cutting is happening over top. Now it's cutting some sort of slot. Four at a go. I mean, this this is absolute state of the art for the era. Pip pip pip. Like a xylophone. Now the BAR, the original ones did have an overhead cut. I assume for uh, original assembly, because then there's like a dovetail piece in there, if I'm thinking correctly. Yep, we're back to grinding. How many Dude, this, injuries they had? I wonder if those. What you're looking at? I wonder if those guys got paid better or worse than the jig guys, because the grinding seems like the one sort of freehand, you have to know what you're doing thing, you know? What is going on here? Uh, magazine boxes? Oh, yes, you're on it. Boxes. Look at that. Look at that. So I get questions all the time. People are like, you know, why haven't, you know, Ian still wants some reproduction RSC 1917 clips. Uh, lots of guys do actually. I've had quite a few emails, and I've shared the production, like I've shared the measurements, I've shared everything with a bunch of people, but it's come to nothing. And this is why, because this is how they were made. You have to have, you know, thin sheet steel, and then you have to just hammer it into the correct shape. And look at the machines involved. Like again, this magazine's a little more complicated than a clip, but the clip still has to be sort of die cut and then shaped, and people to do it. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you know, go on. No, you go ahead. Completely underestimate how difficult press tooling is. Um, and for things like magazines, I mean, you just need to, to look at how many attempts at repro magazines have just been crap. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they don't work, or they work after you hand fit them, or what have you. And the engineering that goes into it, and the amount of trial and error on the machines just to get all the tolerancing right and to get it all to function right is just immense and it will be exactly the same with the the rsc clips and um just minor variations um calvin of uh Farpower united sent me a couple of the um the nasty italian uh, 303 clips and the difference seems to be that they use the next size up uh metric steel so it's like 10 or 15 thou thicker it's like nothing oh man and they don't work as a result and they were probably made on 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 British tooling, but just with the next size up of steel, and they don't work, and it's it's a matter of of uh, a couple uh, a couple of tens of thou, if that. Right, and then trying to predict the machine how it's going to drop them in and blah blah blah. It, it it's no joke that it is a very expensive concept to go back and make those RSC clips, and there's so few people that own the guns. Even if they pay, you know, a hundred dollars a clip, it's still probably not enough to cover just half the setup. If you were to try to really crank them out. So instead, yeah, the, the you're... tool and die setup is is what's you know be like ten thousand dollars. Yeah, like well, getting the getting the cut die, and then God help you if you got it wrong, you know. Well, because you could run a whole batch that would be be junked, and that happened with some of the some of the stem mags because they were subcontracted out to everybody, and stem mags vary between perfect and will not run under any circumstances. That's um, and all. It, all it can take is uh, is a bolt getting loose on the on on the on the on the tooling, and just 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 imagine that a guy runs a couple of thousand with a bolt slightly loose, so a critical diameter is just critical dimension is just slightly off, right. and the mags won't run. And then you've got to trace them back and try and isolate the ones out of the out of the system. And this is why mags are always a problem. Mag technology is actually 
pretty wild. People take it for granted because they seem like the disposable part of the gun. But, the, you know, I try to explain to people all the time, detachable box magazines were a concept in, like, the 1850s. Like, we, we knew about it. It was just, look at what it takes to get one just right. And then you go out in the field and it gets dented, and what are you going to do? So, you know, putting it in the gun and making it out of much harder receiver steel, and just dealing with the reloading issue, a lot easier, a lot more sensible, for a long time anyway. I wish we should probably let this progress too. All right. <laughs> They're replaying the same. That w- there was something. There was something cathartic about about watching watching that, those mag boxes being made. Though that was beautiful. Yeah, you know, it's a lot of effort to get to something to happen fast. Well, boy, she assembled a mag like nobody's business. They were probably oh, we got, on piecework. We got more. They probably paid. Look at that, more female workers. This was a big thing too. Is how many women it put in the workplace. Like something it, locks. You know, if you're you're watching this and. Most of this work, there's, there's the way it's so industrialized, you know, 30, 40 years beforehand, before this sort of revolution, a lot of the handwork, like what she's doing or the uh, milling and all the other stuff that we're seeing, if you pay attention, the women are having, the, they have the simpler roles in this, but that's more out of habit because the guys doing the work, it's not exactly like very few require so much strength that you have to be mr muscle like the machines are doing a lot more of the work as you get further into this process i mean even from watching the 1917 to this just from the 1917 to the bar you see a lot less sort of hard labor being put into assembling the gun yeah and the other thing you're not seeing it's worth it's often worth pointing out what you're not seeing is measuring yeah no it's all done on jigs and then someone at the uh at the end would check them against a go gauge and a no gauge for every single piece. Um, and normally there'd even be uh, sets of master gauges because gauges wear out. Right. So you'd have gauges well, they get... for the jigs for... for the parts. Gauges for the gauges for the parts. So there'd be, there'd be working gauges that would be used on the factory floor and then a set of master gauges because they'd have to constantly be making gauges. And it was, I mean, uh, tool maker is a role. So the guys that, that, that make all the, all the specialist tooling, all the odd size drill bits, odd size cutters, but there would be gauge makers as well who would very, very precisely make the factory floor gauges, which would be checked against the master gauges. Which, by the way, is what you're trying to do is get all your talent concentrated to a small number of people so a broader number of people can do the work. Exactly. Exactly. It's to try and, to try and reduce... The amount of technical knowledge needed. To... Yeah. All right. So let's appreciate this zero. bolt. i got to appreciate this bolt for a second. Look at this. I'm gonna cut that surface in there. Sparks just flying in his face. Yeah, right? He's fine. He can squint. What is is that the trigger group? What is that? That's another that's another shaper with a single point linear cutter. You want to try to figure out what he's shoving in there? Looks like maybe trigger guard, lower receiver. Yeah. I yes. Think so. that's, yep. That's yep. There it is. Cutting cutting an oblique angle. Just the amount of exposed rotating machinery is. And facial hair. Seriously, though, there's no hats in this shop. They must have gotten a hat stuck in a belt at some point. (laughs) So we've got women for assembly, it looks like. No, that's the... I'm looking at the... They're gauging. Are they gauging? Just inspecting. Those are gas pistons. They do look like they're just inspecting. Oh, look at this. Imagine your job was to just assemble BARs all day. It sounds fun for a second, and then... Yeah. I imagine it would get very boring very quickly. Actually, as someone that's assembled BARs, no. It's not that much fun. And then th- this is the height of production engineering at the time. I mean, the US BAR was massively improved on that front later, and then the Belgian ones improved even further. In terms of manufacturing um, or just you, the gun? Of the, well, the design of the gun for manufacturing. Oh, hell, that so was the a number nice of, shot. So the number of, um, uh, the number of cuts, the, 
the way it goes together, things like that. Mm. Okay, so what is going on here? He's got a rig. That's test firing. Yeah, but is he just doing it off the shoulder instead of that whole machine? Oh, he's doing it full auto. Um, I suspect that's not him, because um, I suspect that's just a function check. And uh, Dale, the Stungrad 57. I don't expert, understand why it goes up and down point. like that. I think it's so he can rest up against it. I think he's leaning into it so he doesn't get ex exhausted. He goes low. Then he goes high and lowers it down? I'm confused. Yeah. I agree with Bloke, though. It seems more like a function check, because he sure as heck isn't aiming, unless the rig somehow, like, locks it in. But then who's inspecting? Yeah. Also, who the heck um, is shooting a group like that with a BAR? Who's uh, changing that rest. target? Yeah, that's got to be mounted. That It's got to be from a machine rest. Because if you look, you see every... It's almost it's an almost even distribution of when you have a zinger, which means that's probably the gun's fire rate exceeding the return spring of whatever the the mount is. Because it ain't that guy. There was a similar thing in the Stumgo 57 factory, and they'd fire them at high angle and low angle and into into tubes. And there was a guy that just did that all day. Oh, God, your hands would just some... vibrate. Oh. <sighs> How would you right, like a, just a rolling rack of BARs, by the way? Yeah, that would be nice. Um, I had a, a physiotherapist in Holland, uh, and one of the patients he treated was one of the guys from the police that fired handguns all day, testing them for ballistic tests and things, and he wrecked the tendons in his arms. Oh, I don't doubt that for a second. Any sort of vibration over and over again. All right, so I think this is the end of the BAR section, because I know I dropped another video in. So let's see what our last bit is. Okay, we're outside. God, that is crowded. Also, can you imagine the streetcars just wandering around? I am stopping around? for you. Yeah, get out of the way. <laughs> People packed in there like sardines, man, all <laughs> hanging yeah. out the ends. Yeah, women workers again, which is good. The, yeah, this is the other thing. So um, I think it was Goltz, uh, the... German officer that was sent to um, the Ottoman Empire, but Goltz was uh, he had this theory of total warfare in which the entire population is engaged in the art or in the act of a war and so everybody would lend themselves to the war effort and he correctly predicted that that would be the way wars would be fought next because of rising nationalism and stuff but I don't think even he predicted that you would then mobilize women like, I don't even think he saw this coming. But, uh, you know, it's an interesting thing, but, you know, mobilizing even some of the women in the country gives you a dramatically larger workforce and allows you to free up soldiers. I have no idea what component that is. It's what? a lamp. I like his facial hair, but I have no idea what that is. Ooh, oh, I love this guy. Oh. That is the whittling master. They got him. That's the first bit of hand fitting we've seen. I don't even know what this is. Can't tell what it is. Think that's, is that even guns related? Well, that's a crank arm of some sort. Well, that might be for a tripod. Maybe I can't tell. Or are we on to engines this is, at this point? Everyone oh, is water jackets working no. at a furious pace, though. Everyone. Are, I see handles and water jackets. See it in the back. Of the ah. Hand. Oh yeah. Ah yeah. There we go. I think we know what gun this is. Ah, and that guy on the left is gauging. I love the inspectors. They're just going around being like, yep, it's a tube. Look at this tube. Hmm. And uh, you know, he, no tube. You know, he's a big shot because he's got the lab coat on. Oh, yeah. And we're assembling? Wow, that was quick. But that, that guy bottom okay. right is in uh, army uniform. Oh, we're in full suits and everything. Yeah, what factory are we in? Okay, so this is actually kind of interesting. Like, look at how well dressed everybody is in this factory. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there's no. lots of guys in uniform. Well, there's lots of guys in ties. Like, well, maybe it's because the bow ties the... and stuff. And... Well, these guys aren't. Whatever they are doing, I don't even know what. <laughs> he's, he's having a good old time. Like, that's that's like. Yeah. 
but um, I mean, the, the women are in dresses. These guys, though, they're all wearing ties. That guy's wearing a vest in the background, although we're in inspection, I guess. But it's weird. Look at the assembly guys in, like, are those three-piece suits? Or just a... Well, there's an army, dude. Oh, I'm, I'm wondering if they're not inspecting. Rather than assembling, the, the, they're not taking the finished product apart to... Well, they're assembling right now. Inspect. Well, Maybe they're done inspecting? Or maybe they're just 4 3. Look at this, this is wild. Although, again, this factory is not big on hats. Like the other one was. I wish I knew, like, which one was the factory from the 1917 one. The files don't say. So. I'm kind of curious because whoever it was, like, one of them was really big into hats. Oh, yeah. I've done this before. Yeah, so he's so he's breaking that down and then putting it back together, so it's presumably inspection. Now, this gentleman looks familiar to me, and I can't figure out where from, and it's driving me crazy, but he was in another piece of footage, because this, this same footage appears broken up in another video, the 1917 footage, um, and he just looks so familiar to me, and I can't place where I know him from. It's driving me insane. He knows how to assemble a gun, though. Look at that. Oh yeah, just let that rip. Hey, hang on, that's not that's not one of the Brownings, is it? He looks like a Browning to me, but it's not Val, and it's not John Moses, to my knowledge. Cameraman, just stand was, in front of this thing. Is he Ed Browning, maybe? Somebody Google that. <laughs> he's old. He's too old to be Val Browning, but he definitely has a Browning family resemblance, doesn't he? And they were a big family. Well, Mormons. I want to say that he had, like, a bunch of siblings that were still named John. Like, I think they ran out of names. Well, he didn't even have the rear sight on there, and he's just ready to go. I, he's in the factory. Where's that going? I know. <laughs> <laughs> no hearing protection, not even flinching. No, and dip it. Look at the dip going, because that ain't chewing gum. Yep. <laughs> Where's he spitting that out? <laughs> he's just swallowing it. Oh, God. I had a buddy who dipped, and he would, like, leave Mountain Dew bottles full of brown liquid in my car. Nice. Yeah. Lovely. I mean, he's still my buddy, but he doesn't dip anymore, which is so much nicer. <laughs> Look at it go. Where are the bullets going, though? Somebody's gonna, in the comments, is gonna figure out who that guy is, and it's gonna... Oh, yeah, it. yeah, that's the fun part, you know? Someone, someone will spend, like, eight hours looking matching up his face. Look see. at it blowing steam. Like for dust? Is that just dust off the floor? No. It's, it's, it's steam. It's steam because uh, it, steam it cooks up. Think, yeah, you've got steam out of the jacket and I think you've also got um if it's a brand new gun, you've got oil and stuff from the uh from the receiver where it's getting warm as well. <laughs> what is he doing? Like he's not, it's just a function check, I guess, because he has no rear sight. Not that they I'm trying to track it down, but apparently the rear sights were calculated wrong on these. Just shoot yes, 500 rounds. Uh, this notebook. Yeah, um, they'd uh, they totally misestimated the uh, the long range ballistics, and uh, the machine gunners that are trained on British and French gear were used to laying down barrages at like 3,000 plus yards, and so right. they found with their with their 1917s that they couldn't. Um. Even though the site said it, they 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 fired massively short. Um, for anyone watching who survived this far, uh, read Hatcher's notebook on this stuff because Hatcher was intimately involved and has some of the best explanations of it. I always wonder. I haven't been able to prove whether that got handed over to the nineteen or three or not. Like I've heard it mentioned, but I mean, in terms of actual documentation, like somebody saying, and then we had to go back and do this. I just haven't. Like it's, I'm sure it's out there. I just haven't bumped into it because. I get this a lot, but um, I never have the time people think I do. So, you know, I get I get about two weeks of, well, an episode has to drop every two weeks. So I realistically only get like a week's worth of time to take any one research vector. So 
I mean, just try imagining like getting everything right in one week. That's what I have to do over and over and over again. It's super annoying. <laughs> like some episodes are a little easier, so like I shed a day or two and put them on another project. But it is crazy I think, hard. I think a lot of people assume you just know everything about everything. You know, don't do any research. You just you just know. It. No, that's bloke, and you can tell. Oh, by, okay. Yeah, by watching all this, send all your questions to bloke because what I'm gonna. <laughs> Like, especially, I, I, especially like the the value of your Mosin to God or whatever. You know? Well, honestly, the the big reason why I'm you know good, quote unquote, at uh, organizing information is that I'm so terrible at retaining it. So my memory for this stuff is so awful, and everybody else is like they expect me to be sort of like a fact. Like I'll run into people in person and they'll just be like oh man i love the show hey uh on on episode 27 you said this and i'm i got this other one that doesn't really do that and i'm like oh god i have no clue like i don't uh, like everything what's what's, what's an episode 27 uh. yeah i'm like uh whatever i said is everything i knew then and i know less now because i'm forgetful <laughs> <laughs> other information came in and knocked that old information out yeah I just wish I had the same same retention for information as I had when I was eighteen, but uh, I'm getting middle aged, so uh, that's why you got to record it's, it's everything awful. and then yep, be adorable because that's your only way out. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well that's it. That's all I got. Um, any final notes? What do you guys think? That was super cool. Yeah, don't they just uh, don't don't work in a gun factory in uh, early of twenty century. Yeah, you know, there's there's a lot of missing steps and steps out of order. Like, I mean, there's so much not on film for this. Like, uh, I yeah, think. It, well, for, it, make, it makes you wonder. They went through all the the trouble of filming this. Where did this footage go? Did it go into something that was edited, or you know? That's true. Well, some of it I've seen remixed elsewhere for like, you know, uh, propaganda use or internal use. Uh, it's I probably think probably mostly for the newsreels. Yeah, well, maybe because how much of this do you want to put out on a newsreel at that time? One thing: this a lot of the the the, the Pathé archives, the British Pathé archives, have been put up, and then they took an awful lot of uh, of film to just use a couple of seconds of it. Um, and it's, to be fair, that I I know that feeling. And. So I, I suspect that's what's gone on here, and then they've uh, they've they've published the archive, and it's brilliant. I mean, it's one of the great things about living in this era is that a lot of these old archives that no one had ever seen before just get put online for everyone to to see, and you can you can go through reels and reels and reels of uh, World War One, World War Two, um, unpublished newsreel, and it's. I mean, information access is unbelievably high. Like these guys couldn't fathom being able to to take information in as fast as we take it in today. Now the problem is we're not all that good at differentiating truth from fiction sometimes, but you know, at least we get a lot of data. Okay, see, these guys yeah, are that guy is wearing a hat and he is still in the belt room, and that terrifies me. Look at how hot, close that hat's getting to that belt. <laughs> At least I don't have like neckties hanging down, you know, dangling around. This guy gets safety glasses. Look, he's got like the old style uh, with the side side protectors. Now that thing's that thing's throwing off the chips, though. Yeah, how bad must it be that they actually give you personal protective equipment? Like you get PPE, <laughs> it must be an eye. Yeah, get him go. All right. Well, I think we've watched enough of this. Um, I'm sure we <laughs> blathered for quite a while. Hopefully, that was entertaining to everybody. Um, hopefully, you learned something. If even if that's just how dumb we are, but uh, yeah, I think I think this really spells out why, like when we talk about something like the Shoshaw being a terrible gun and a brilliant idea, you can see why. Because like the amount of effort that goes into just making something, and when people talk about like why did they just do this or do that, it's like well. You know, for any change in the gun, you have to make a hundred changes in the production line. And look at this production Everything line. has to come to a dead stop, too. Right. You know? Like, imagine planning all this. And then, you know, you talk about, you know, like the U.S. took this many months to get this factory set up or whatever. Hmm. Now it's they're saying, oh, wow, I guess they were a little delayed. You can go, holy crap, how they do that in under a decade. Because, I mean, just look at this. 
The planning is amazing. Yeah, the training, the the tool and die making. You change one thing, and you have to change everything else down the line too, most likely. Yeah, it, I mean, think about it this way: this whole process was done for the British contract first for this particular gun, and that was handed over 1915. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's wild. Okay, well, anyway, I think we 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 beat the point home. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining me, guys. Uh, if you guys want to find these two, I will post appropriate visual indicators for their YouTube channels. How Flater Mouse shoots uh, anything you want out of a shotgun. Like, it just honestly, just mail him stuff, and he'll just put it in the shotgun. It's fine. <laughs> And then Bloke is a uh, competing historical channel, so don't ever check on him because I need all your views. <laughs> but uh, yeah, actually do check in on Bloke because uh, I've said this before. It, we can all do the same episode on the same gun and it's not going to be the same content and you're going to get different perspectives and you're going you're gonna to learn more. So whenever possible, read stuff that you've already read just from someone else and you'll be amazed at what comes out like no one person can cover all of firearms history which is why it's really fun to have friends like this watch your thoughts he does a better job than me <laughs> no i just decided i've just given myself an insane task <laughs> after a year there was a better place for it well, yeah, but I'm not. So, you know, when I burn out and just sort of like either die or go into a coma, you guys can take everything. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, on that positive note, have a good one. Uh, I know a lot of you are hanging out at home at this time. So hopefully this was a good time killer. Uh, and we're glad you all tuned in. Have a good one. Good night.